I would say a, a good portion of the reason why I thought, well, heck, this year, maybe we'll do a cotton panel and give some more insight um, to something a little bit more locally is because last year, after we got done with Winter Conference, I had some cotton growers walk up to me when the event was completely over and they said, do you guys have products for cotton? And I thought, well, we missed the mark there because obviously we have a lot of products that are directly related to cotton, but because it's a Midwest simulcast, there wasn't as much mention to the cotton industry. And in this area, obviously around Texas and Oklahoma and, and uh, into southern Kansas, a lot of guys are, you know, if they haven't in the past, they're moving into cotton and, and um, it becomes a lot more applicable to those products. So what we're going to do, we're going to keep it, I mean, it's fairly informal. You know, there's probably only 30 or so of us in here. Um, but we do have a couple growers on the board that have uh, voluntold. <laughs> that they would come up here. And uh, we, we kind of gave them some questions just to give them an oversight. It's not directly related to precision, but uh, to some extent, just to kind of get a general idea on some stuff that they have fought with in the past on planters related to cotton and, and kind of give you guys an overview on, you know, why they made the decisions that they've made and what improvements they've made uh, to their planter pass. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I guess to kind of kick it off, why don't we go through, and there's a couple dealers, you guys can just mention you know, who you are and where you're from, and then as we get to you guys that are farming, if you don't mind going through you know, how long you farmed, the types of scenarios that you're farming into, you know, what you're farming with, and, and so forth, and we'll just give kind of a quick intro. So go ahead, Hans. So Hans Jensen uh, from Delhart with Planerology, and we're a dealership there and whatnot. I'm Wade Davis, a uh, farmer around Happy and Tulia, uh, mostly all no-till, and I do some custom stuff that's not no-till. Alex Cohen, Northeast Texas, Paris, I guess would be our closest major town. Farm with my dad since I was 18, so I guess I'd make it six years. And uh, all conventional till, except a few double crop soybeans, cotton, corn. David Warren, La Mesa, Texas. I've been farming 20 years, and it's nearly all dry land and all conventional till. Walter Spurlock, Stratford, Texas. Six years, uh, conventional till, strip till, and then no till, cotton on cotton. And then I'm Kevin Williams. I'm with Ag Ingenuity out of Sunray, and I'm just a precision tech. You're not just a precision tech. You're a good precision tech. <laughs> I do agronomy. Yeah. I'm not a precision tech. I am not tech. too, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so for the dealers to kind of give guys an overview, what's the most common and overlooked maintenance item that you find on cotton planters over and over again? doesn't matter. You guys can have the time to start. Downfor Probably. Easy for me, Hans. I just It's a downpour system. It's usually springs or an airbag or some uncontrolled system. You know, we have row command a lot of times, and you know, or, and and sometimes we don't, but everything is usually either springed or single airbagged. And then y'all may have noticed in presentations where they're blocking up the disc. You set the set your 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 disc openers at like two inches or whatever. Block it up, and and see if they're actually two inches, because more than likely they're they're not, and way more than likely they're not. So, so when we're only planting cotton three quarters of an inch deep in, in some areas, when we have a half inch variance in depth across those T handles, that's a big deal. And so we had some customers this last season going through and doing that, and they were planting a half inch variance, went back in. He said that was the best cotton crop we've ever had after leveling that up. The other thing to keep in mind is with the cotton, with that plant performing so much differently than corn, guys may think that, spacing, singulation, emergence, it doesn't matter in cotton. It'll make up for it. So we finally sat down and we started taking each of these different variables to yield. When a plant is spaced in properly, we're going to affect yield by maybe around 5% or so. If we start getting into a multiple where we've got extra plants in there, we're going to be a little bit more, maybe up around that 7 And we get into where there's a plant missing, we're going to be down around 10 to 15% loss in yield for each one of those plants. And then if that plant's shorter than its neighbor, we can get up to about, another, about a combined 30 plus percent loss in yield per plant across there. So 
the numbers are different than corn, but they're still there and they're still very, very much costly. Sure. So my setup, I do pop up and two by two. So I'm 100% no till. So I've got to put on quite a bit of fertilizer. Um, my two by two opener, if we plant into moisture, we have a lot of issues with my opener. I've switched to the spoke gauge wheels, still have issues. Uh, not, we don't have a good ride and things ball up. So with my setup, it's the two by two and I'm looking at maybe going trying to conceal out this year to see if we could solve that problem. I guess for me, probably one of the biggest ones that I've seen <clears throat> is, it has already been mentioned, is the depth variance. If your mustache on the bottom of your T-handle has anywhere or there's, I mean, there's a number of factors there that influence that. If that depth changes, you get uneven emergence on cotton, and it's a big it's a big hit. Also, your closing system, how wide your closing wheels are spaced out at that narrow or at that shallow of depth, they're spaced out too wide. You're basically, I guess you could say, crimping that closed and below the seed and leaving it loose up around the seed and can tend to dry out. I'd say in the past, before we went to uh, Delta Force, the Delta Force system, um, we would get in a hurry and we would get uneven depth just for, from bouncing. And also, we plant on raised beds and with three bushel boxes full of seed, you're squatting that bed and it can create baking issues. And when you're down to a quarter of a box, you're obviously not planting in the same depth but with the with the Delta Force, we haven't had that problem at all, and we just we've gone from telling all the farm hands to plant at five and a half miles an hour to just looking at the good ride. And if the good ride is 98 percent or 96 percent, we'll bump our speed up to eight miles an hour and get a lot more ground covered. Yeah, I guess just reiterate the delta force is uh, essential especially on our planters that we have ccs uh the wings really tend to uh be uh light especially once you've got two boxes of seed in it and with the delta force you're able to compensate and get an even uh i guess seed depth planter wide whether you're in row number 24 underneath the boxes or you're out on say number one or 48 your, it just helps out. It makes it makes you feel a lot more confident that your emergence is going to be uniform or as uniform as we can get it. Um, the only thing other than that would just be making sure, you know, mechanically making sure their opening disc are in good shape and they're not wore down a little bit. I feel like if they're wore down slightly, you get a little bit of crumble at the bottom of the seed bed, which it can cause issues. Uh, Delta Force. <laughs> Delta Force by far. And Ron Nick's my dealer here. It was one of those, we were looking at converting several planters and it was going to be a lot of money. And I'm like, man, I don't know that I really need that. And I slept on it and called Ron the next day and said, okay, let's try it. And that was the overall best thing we could have ever, ever done. It's just improved our stand and our speed getting across a lot of acres. Mm -hmm. Delta Force as well, but we'll add the VSET meter to that. Comparing our cotton stand with a lot of the neighbors, it made VSET. I mean, sure, I didn't go out and weigh it or anything like that, like Hans has been doing, but when you look at the skips and multiples they had in their stand versus the 99 plus singulation that the VSET performed, it made, I mean, the dollars that it cost put the V set on was cheap. For me, I'd say Delta Force also. I've got three bushel boxes, and that sure helps, and especially on some harder no-till ground. But 
I'd also go a step further and say, being on a cotton panel and say yield sense on my combine, that's been a good return on investment for me because I like doing a lot of experiments and when we harvest, we know exactly what it is right then. We don't have to have a weight wagon or somebody out there to verify. We could just, just go. Sure. Uh, I like the metrics that Precision Plant brings. You know, they could measure just about anything. And I'm a numbers guy. I really like that we could change things because we could, we could see what we're doing. And so I think there's no comparison uh, to any other products than Precision Plant. They just have some really good stuff. Um, and we've seen good yields too. Um, does that answer your question? I guess for us, my dad and I, why we chose to invest, it started out of curiosity back in 2008 with a Gen 1 seed sense monitor. I just, it seemed like something that might pay off in the future. Added that and started calculating seed savings with row clutches and added row clutches to a 12 row planter. And that was, that was corn at that time. And we just, we've never been, I guess you'd say, the ones to adapt the first year it comes out on most of the products, but slowly transitioning that way because every product we put on, we see a return. And so we just keep, it seems like we're on it a little bit faster each time it comes out. I farm some pretty tough dry land acres and a lot of times we only get one shot at sticking a crop and we just don't get the next rain timely enough to go back and fix any problems. And I know that there were several years that planter malfunctions or uh, not realizing that we were planting in rougher conditions and bouncing across just because we were in a hurry to get across it cost us lots of yield. And when I've got one shot at it, I need to have the best product I can have out there to get the best stand at the time. Uh, for me, as all of the above, between the seed savings, the uh, technology, the metrics, the mapping, and the data that uh, Precision's allowed us to be able to collect, it's been phenomenal. We've really been able to make um, improvements based on our historic data. And then the uh, only thing I'd add on top of that is a uh, remote view. I uh, really like being able to remote view without having the operator to have to let me in. Something to add to that as we think through when, yeah, we had really good yields this year. The question is, is are we there yet? We saw some 347 bushel corn and yield plots this year. So that correlating them back over, it's like, okay, is five bell cotton as far as we can go. How much further can we go? And as long as we keep finding higher yields, let's never give up. And at what point did mediocrity set in? At what point do we allow good to displace being great? It takes diligence and keeps looking. Obviously, we've got to be extremely profitable, but always keep looking and keep experimenting. Ask, how can we do this better? Uh, for me, on my planter, uh, it'd be um, conceal. Uh, we put down a lot of fertilizer with the planter, and that's my weak, weak link, and I know it. There's a lot of times I can't plant because it's too wet, and that's frustrating when I could normally plant if I didn't have the fertilizers on there. So um, looking at conceal and maybe furrow jet for this next year. Right. So the... Big thing with furrow jet is even in a sandier environment, one of the very fascinating things we found was actually in the subsequent wheat crop. So we was going back in there. We were seeing green lines every 30 inches. 
and you can see the wheat rows going like this, but there was still green stuff going on. We ended up correlating that back to we had a better band of phosphorus, and the wheat ended up finding it. And on the corn side, Besners, they had some of the best corn yields they've ever had, and some of the greenest corn much earlier versus the neighbor across the fence. There's yellow patches and everything there. They're farming on the same dirt, very similar fertilizer program, very similar tillage practices. The difference is, is timing and placement of that fertilizer has a huge impact on that. Now, that being said, we want to be very careful. One of the things they didn't go into this year that they've gone into in years past is the lower our parts per minute is of FOSS, the better return we're going to get off of the phosphorus that we end up applying. So also being strategic and not putting money per se into iron unless we're willing to change practices isn't going to necessarily drive a return. But if we want to change stuff, we can mine that soil down to a much lower level than what we thought was previously possible and keep that plant spoon fed through the season. I guess the product that we see the most valuable at this point in time is conceal. We have it ordered. It's going on our planter. And I might add one more thing that wave vision has been a big part, played a big part in our, with the cotton. And it seemed like, well, fellow growers around there were complaining, well, I can't see what I'm doing. It's monitors blanking out, showing erratic seed spacing population, what have you, if their monitor allowed them to even show that. Our monitor, we consistently showed exactly what was happening. The way Vision seen the cotton seed, reported it exactly how it was, wasn't being disturbed by dust or any such thing like that. I'd say the one area of my planning that I'm not satisfied with is our closing system. And we've tried everything under the sun. And uh, one year something works great, and the next year conditions just don't allow that to be the best. And I'm hoping um, the new furrow force system would be an option. And I'm looking forward to maybe trying that. Yes, add them to the list. <laughs> Across our planters and our farm, I feel like our next step is to move in with a smart firmer, start getting real-time uh, soil mapping. Uh, that way we're able to really take a good look with what uh, nutrients or organic matter we've got in our soils across uh, our corn and cotton rotation, as well as where we go cotton on cotton. Has anybody looked at hill drop? Are you all planning hill drop or know of anybody that's doing it? Or are there any studies or what are we looking at? So we put in a fair bit of hill drop, both two hill and three hill in, in conjunction with singulated cotton. The, probably the biggest mistake we made going into that is we had the assumption of looking back what were guys doing 30 years ago and what were guys doing further south. And looking at the vigor of emergence of these new hybrids it's not, not advantageous as well as the absolute struggle, even with all the control that we have, in order to get all two or three of those seeds to stay together, there's a lot of other things that are hurting our yield worse than being able to get up through the, up through the crust that may be developing there and certainly looking at furrow force going forward and seeing what can we do to be able to drive that and ensure that that seed has no impedance making it to the surface. So you're saying simulation is more important than Yeah, the, the delayed, the, the variability in emergence and then having those cl plants clustered together, we're not giving each plant equal opportunity at sunlight, and so we're, we're hurting our yield potential there by having those plants too close to each other. The, the improvement in emergence, which we didn't even see that, is is hurt by having those plants clustered too close together. And I might say just for us and our operation, and I know every operation is different, and I'm not saying that this is how it needs to be, but just kind of back up what Han said there, for us, we really see no need to go heel drop if it's the vigor of emergence that you're after. For us, running the Delta Force of E-Drive, we planted... 42,000 population, singulated. We come back 
as the first plant was emerging, mark that time, within 24 hours, we had 39 of the 42 plants in a stand check up. One thing to add back to the conversation on furrow jitter, and the reason why I didn't bring up the yield plot that we put in on that is because we didn't have a yield plot of ver or different rates of fertilizer. We had a plot in regards to what's the financial impact of not having uniform available moisture at that. On this particular one, we had gone in, planted half the field, went and planted the other half, started the pivot on the first half, four-day loop. By the time it got around to the other half, we had ended up losing $29 an acre on corn due to uneven moisture available to that corn under a pivot to get that stuff out of the ground. We put that in cotton, we're gonna be looking at the same sort of variable, different yield numbers obviously, but the importance of uniformity of moisture and then getting that crop out of the ground in a uniform fashion is probably one of our larger drivers. I've never had any trouble with the V-Drive on my system at all. We've covered a lot of acres per row unit on mine. I'd just like to say if you're going from drive shaft and chains with bearings that the V-Drive, but just being a smoother operating platform without the jerking of the chains and, and no matter if you replace your bearings every year, you're going to have a little bit of slack between the, the drive wheel and the planter box and it's just unbelievable the the uh, better spacing you get with the V-Drive and it's planter maintenance to start the year takes instead of it taking two or three days going through bearings and everything takes like a couple hours maybe. Yeah. We actually had a customer that plants 12,000 acres with 216 rows that went high speed and uh, they cut that and of course they doubled they they plant full circles, but they split plants. They plant half the circles and then come back later six weeks and plant the other side. They, they actually, this season with speed tube, only planted five days a week because they outran their combines considerably, and they only average about 500 acres a day. And they ran in the low sevens between like 6.5 and 7.1. But we had been pogoing their fields and getting true stand counts and stuff. And, and the year before, they were at like 94% with V-Drive Delta. We threw a speed tube on there this year. They went a lot faster, and their their ear their ear counts and stuff ninety eight plus on every single field. We 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 tried to figure it mathematically. It was almost a five percent gain across the farm, but by going faster. Control of the seed. No, so no. We were planting in heavy corn on corn, of course, and it's strip tilled. Most of it's strip tilled. The, no seed roll, it, the, the, and the seeds were just dead on. And we've used it, we used it cotton too. We've seen one in running cotton, and, and seeds are right there. If we didn't get it up, it was a germination problem like everyone has. You know, when you plant it 100%, but we're going to get 90% of it up. But uh, it, it just, the stance is incredible. The placement is incredible. And, and, and the V-set plant's incredible. It always has, but the placement with the speed tube, and we're going to be testing it this year on five mile an hour planters because not everybody wants to go 10. But we're going to throw some speed tubes intermittently in the planter and just to see the difference in spacing because if we can gain four or five percent from spacing, a speed tube would be a cheap investment. And then if we saw rain and needed to go fast, be awesome too. But as a guy that's worked on meters for over 20 years, I can say that when we went from John Deere to ESET, we gained about 5 or 6% plantability and singulation on cotton. But when we went from ESET to VSET, we gained another 5%. I mean, I can throw an ESET meter on my machine, pull the vacuum as high as I can, and run it reasonably at 4.5 miles an hour. It only plant about 92, 93, a VSET meter up there at 7.5 miles an hour at 65,000, 70,000 population will hardly miss. Something I want to add to, and just to make sure everybody's on the same page, we've thrown out the word pogo multiple times today, and if you're not familiar with that, pogo is a tool that is available to our dealers that they can go out and basically do a very quick stand count um, once the crop is out of the ground. Um, not only stand count, they can check singulation, 
spacing very quickly with that. It's, it's a tool that's connected to an iPad, and you can get immediate results from that. Um, you can use it, it's, it's developed for corn, but we can do singulation spacing counts in cotton as well with that. So if that's something you're interested in, contact you know, your dealer, and uh, they will more than likely have that tool available and get out and check, check fields once the crop is emerged and out of the ground. No, thank you guys for staying around for this too. This kind of concludes what we have, but feel free to stick around and ask, you know, anybody questions. You know, Stacy and I will be here, and Colin will be here for as long as we need to be. So, guys, just be safe, heading back home. <laughs>